Test a gun pointed at my chest. Her boyfriend shot dead when he messed with a neighbor over tree trimming. Vilkin saw himself as this sort of modern day dirty Harry. Go ahead, make my day. Who is this guy? This man who murdered my father. But was her father the Mr. Nice Guy everyone thought? Or did he have a dark side that very few knew about? So what you're saying is that John Upton deserved to die. This was a fight over shrubbery. Lethal landscaping. Plus, getting maced while you wait for muffins? <laughs> Road rage move over. The new thing is cutting in line rage. Lines can actually be hazardous to your health. Out of line. And every hair's in place, but those tempers? Let my people go! When the people you elect go into meltdown mode. Yeah. I will not yield to the government! Tonight, they're losing it. Ah! Here now. Elizabeth Vargas and David Muir. Tonight, in the middle of a long, hot summer, perhaps you've seen it yourself, heated tempers in your own neighborhood. But this evening here, you're about to see when things get overheated, neighbors losing it. And right here on 2020, you'll hear the heart-pounding 911 calls. The witness who heard her boyfriend shot down just steps away from her, and all of it because of a fight over a tree. Matt Gutman at the scene of the crime. Will you agree with the verdict? In the lush green hills of Gentile, Encinitas, California, a toxic tale of shrubbery. The invasive Brazilian pepper tree and two men losing it in a dispute over clearing poisonous bushes from a driveway. 911 emergency. My partner just got shot. Please come to Blown Jack Road. Please hurry, hurry. He's bleeding, but shot in the head. For Evelyn Zeller, March 28th, 2013 began as a beautiful day. Hey, they're all beautiful days here in the San Diego suburbs. That morning, she awoke in the master bedroom of this rented Spanish contemporary and shared a tender moment with her boyfriend, John Upton. It was my birthday. John woke me up to wish me a happy birthday. She says Upton, still in his pajamas, headed outside to make room for two day laborers clearing brush on the driveway of their neighbor, Michael Vilkin. John went out to offer to yes. move the car. Yes. To understand what happened next, you need to understand the lay of the land. Upton lived here. Vilkin owned the adjacent, undeveloped 2.6 acre lot, including this narrow strip, his future driveway. The problem was these Brazilian pepper trees along that strip had become a creeping menace. Choking off access, and Vilkin needed them gone. On this morning, Upton's Mercedes SUV is parked beside the trees on Vilkin's land. He wanted to move the car to give them more space to trim the trees. Just a couple of minutes later, Evelyn gets up to follow him outside. I had set foot on the first step right there as I heard the shots. Using this massive 44 Magnum revolver, Vilkin shoots 56-year-old John Upton once in the midsection, followed several seconds later by a second shot to the head, execution style. So I look up the path and I see John lying on the path. And you instantly knew that he was dead? I felt he was dead. And suddenly I hear Vilkin go, don't get any closer. And he has the gun pointed at my chest. He has a crazy, crazy dude. He's got a gun. Oh my God. What a what? The guy, he's still got a gun man. You gotta be careful. None of it makes sense. Cold-blooded murders just don't happen around here in sunny Encinitas. And neither of these men were magnets for trouble. Certainly not the diminutive, cerebral, and hard-working Michael Vilkin. It was just a shock to imagine that Michael was the one to do that. The neighbors were aghast. Yeah, I talked to him all the time. He was friendly to us. He let us park on his lot. Tamara Vilkin, Michael Vilkin's wife and companion for the past 30 years, stands by her man. Michael has beautiful heart. And other people saying that to me. It's not me saying that. They were God-fearing immigrants who fled the former communist Soviet Georgia to chase their American dream. They bought this vacant land on Lone Jack Road after years of scrimping and saving from his past fledgling career as an economist and hers as a piano teacher. Did he have any, any hopes or dreams for that land? 
Yes, we wanted to build the house over there and probably retire. Bilkin spent every minute he could spare working the land the old-fashioned way with shovel, wheelbarrow, axe, and saw, lovingly nursing it to health. All for the day they could build their dream home. He was here every day for eight to ten hours a day, tending to his empty lot, cutting things down, moving dirt around. As for Vilkin's neighbor, John Upton, a six foot two, 235 pound teddy bear of a man, wasn't a hero only to his children, John and Elizabeth. So many fond memories. So many memories. And you look at, like, in a span of 56 years of how many things he accomplished and how he's impacted the world. Hello! Hello, Alexandra! To many, he was practically a saint. This is 2020. From ABC News. As reported here on 2020 and 1993, John Upton was a documentary filmmaker who made it his personal mission to rescue Romanian orphans. The Romanian government has put these kids on the back burner. However they want me to do it, I'll do it. But for God's sake, let me, let me help these kids. I really knew from a very, very young age that you really can make a difference because I saw my dad do it. Since then, he'd settled down here with his girlfriend, Evelyn, a new ager enthralled with Upton's Zen. We love Buddhas, we love serenity and peacefulness and inspiration. So where did it all go wrong? The answer is in the poisonous trees on that narrow strip of Vilkin's land. Upton liked them, but remember, Vilkin wanted them gone, and his interest in landscaping bordered on obsession. I questioned why he was spending so much time on the lot. He just seemed eccentric. Just seemed a little mm -hmm. eccentric, yeah. Others chose a different word. I think his behavior was absolutely bizarre. I mean, who buys a site and then hangs out on it and works on it 10, 12 hours a day when the same amount of work can be done in a day with a bulldozer? That doesn't make any sense to me. None of what he did was permitted. This was a landslide property. It wasn't safe for the neighbors. Despite those concerns, Evelyn says Upton never complained about his neighbor. He used to say many times, wow, I admire his work ethic. I've talked to my dad for I've talked for, to him every day. Forever. Did he ever mention Vilkin? No, no not, not. Never I've never heard him. that name in my entire life. And yet, surely something happened to provoke that brutal homicide on the morning of March 28th. Something that would make the egghead immigrant lose it. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, he's dead, I think he's dead, hurry up, please. Before she called 911, before she even approached the crime scene, Evelyn Zeller noticed something odd about the shooter. When you came out, he first saw you. What did he do? He was, uh, he seemed to be on the phone. It's not often that the killer calls in the homicide he's just committed, but that's exactly what happened here. An emergency? I need this, uh, detective here. What's going on there? Well, the neighbor told him this and I shot him. In theory, Vilkin did the right thing. He shoots someone, he calls 911. And yet there was something sort of cold and callous about the call. You shot him? Yes. Like with a gun? Yes. Where is the gun right now? I have my gun and don't worry about it. When sheriff comes, it will be in the gun case. I'm a responsible person, don't worry about it. Within minutes, sheriff's deputies arrive to find Vilkin still on the phone with the 911 operator. Hello. What's the phone down? He's arrested, but remains cool and so confident that the next day he agrees to talk with our San Diego affiliate, KGTV, expressing no remorse, Hello. but shockingly, Hello. he does express disappointment. With the performance of the massive handgun he used to kill John Upton this 44 Magnum because he says it failed to drop him with one shot. Michael Vilkin's mission to rid his driveway of Brazilian pepper trees had somehow opened the door to a dark place in his mind where he could justify taking a man's life. Who is this guy? This man who murdered my father in cold blood. For what? 
For good reason, says Vilkin. I expect justice to be done. Because, as he's about to tell us, John Upton was no saint, but a menace who terrorized him like this. Uh, stop cutting trees! Uh. What you're saying is that John Upton deserved to die. Stay with us. We continue with 2020's Losing It. Once again, Matt Gutman. One year after blowing away his neighbor with a cannon of a handgun, Michael Vilkin is on trial. The stakes are high. A total of 50 years to life if convicted of first degree murder. But Vilkin is unfazed. He's confident that this was no murder, but an act of self-defense. This case was justified. Self-defense. Mr. Vilkin protected his life and shot John Hunt. You have to wonder whether Vilkin saw himself as a sort of modern day dirty Harry out there to protect himself against the bad guy in defense of a principle. Go ahead, make my day. He told me, you are a fanatic. The way he looked at me would fry a hamburger. Mr. Bilkin loved owning that piece of land. The defense strategy was to put the victim on trial. According to Vilkin, his neighbor, John Upton, seen as a saint for his selfless work rescuing abused orphans in Romania, had a volcanic temper which had been erupting on Vilkin with increasing ferocity as Vilkin pursued his assault on those trees. The heart of the defense here was that Upton was a threat to Vilkin, that he wasn't just this lovable, friendly guy, but he was an angry, aggressive guy who came after Vilkin. The body language was, don't cut the trees here. When he was talking to me angrily, it was like, ah. But what could have transformed Upton from a global do-gooder to the ogre next door? Remember, he didn't even own his home. He was just renting there. The trees were on Vilkin's property, and he had every right to cut them down. As he's standing on this man's own land. The issue is that, for Upton, these Brazilian pepper trees weren't just pretty. They provided him and his girlfriend, Evelyn Zeller, with precious privacy. Well, he took privacy away. It was just like, wow, do you really need to cut these trees down too? I mean, you'll see how it looks. Rising in the witness stand, Vilkin demonstrates how Upton would get in his face. Uh, stop cutting! Trees! Ah. And Vilkin had a powerful witness to attest to this ugly aspect of John Upton's character. I would say John Upton was a, a bully, a dominant, controlling kind of guy. He liked to get in people's business. Did he get in your business? Yes, he did. Dwayne Byram is the ex-husband of Upton's girlfriend, Evelyn Seller. When I was dropping off my kids, he'd get in my face. Get Back to your car, back to the driveway, you have no right to come to my house. Byram says the verbal abuse was withering and unprovoked. He said, you're a oh, you're a get the off my property. I believe John Upton had a dark side. And so when you hear Michael Vicklin talking about being physically intimidated frequently by John Upton, you're saying that's within the realm of reason. Yes, absolutely. A sheriff's deputy testified that exactly one week before the homicide, Vilkin called for help because Upton's vehicle was parked on Vilkin's driveway where he wanted to work. Mr. Upton got pretty angry and um, began pointing at Mr. Uh, Vilkin and said, uh, don't come any closer to me, something similar to that. In fact, Vilkin made several calls to the sheriff's department for help in dealing with John Upton but profanity is not against the law, and Upton made no specific threats, so there was nothing the authorities could do. He did not threaten to break my neck. He did not threaten to break my legs, but I'm afraid of him. Afraid, but not deterred. Filkin stood his ground, continuing to cut away at those trees while also purchasing that fateful 44 Magnum and warning the Uptons to steer clear. I nailed a sign. The sign said no parking on the 30 feet road. 
But was Vilken secretly plotting something sinister? Two day laborers whose faces we're not permitted to photograph testify that on the morning Vilken went ballistic, they saw him carrying this gun case when he instructed them to remove the Brazilian pepper trees on the driveway where Upton's car was parked. He told you to, if someone came out, don't worry about getting involved, he would take care of it, correct? Yes. Yes, that's right. He was told basically, don't get involved in anything. Mr. Vilken indicated that if somebody comes out, he had a gun for them. Vilkin then retreats a little way up the driveway to a partially obscure vantage point along the fence. Now, someone might suggest that you were lying in wait. If I wanted to wait for him, I would not cut bushes. I would grow the bushes and with a rifle, I would wait in the bushes. And sure enough, within minutes, Upton emerges from his home. And he told you he was going to move his car, correct? I see it. Yes, that's right. I was just afraid to go to work there. Okay. Afraid of? Of John Upton. I was just very concerned that he might do something, something very dangerous. I took the gun out of the gun case and stuck it in the waste bin. Why did you do that? I was getting ready for eventual confrontation. The prosecution had already put on a parade of witnesses to show premeditation. Sheriff's deputies turned Vilkin's claim of self-defense against him, saying he contacted them five times with questions about his right to carry a gun and stand his ground on his land. He was asking um, when it was legally justified to carry a firearm on his property and when he was justified in using it. Ironically, no witness may have been more damaging to the defense than Vilkin himself. Detached, showing zero empathy for his victim, he coolly recounts the morning of March 28th. John Upton came out of his house and bullied him for the last time. When he was about 10 feet away, I saw a pistol in his right hand. It was like one second, and I pulled out my revolver and shot him. But in fact, there was no pistol in Upton's hand, just a Blackberry. As a practical matter, in a case where you're claiming self-defense, with these facts, Vilkin almost had to testify. And yet, he was a pretty terrible witness. He calls the police. Vilkin's attorney, Richard Burkhan, argues it was self-defense. Remember, Vilkin did not run. He stayed and called 911 himself. He could have planned this in such a way that he could have been on a plane to, to Russia uh, before anybody showed up. But he stood there and he stuck around because he believes and he knows he did what he had to do. As the trial winds down, tomorrow Vilkin's faith in her husband and God remain unshakable. And I think everything is in God's hands, you know, right now, whatever he decides. She waits for justice in the sweltering heat of this lonely parking lot outside the jail. And he stood there before the angel. And so as the she angel reads said, the Bible, we visit with a man who thought he could skip that part about thou shalt not kill. Mr. Vilkin, hello. Hello. Are you hopeful? I know this. But would the jury see a man just trying to stand his ground or a stone cold killer? Has the jury reached verdicts? Yes, we have. Here. Stay with us. Twenty Twenty continues once again with Matt Gutman. John Upton is dead. It has been 18 months since his family tearfully buried him. Michael Vilkin is alive, but the jury's about to make the fateful decision about the rest of his life. This isn't bang, bang. He is taking his time. In his closing arguments, the prosecutor opens up on Vilkin, blasting holes in his story, saying his claim of self-defense is indefensible. That gun was overkill. Prosecutors clearly believe this wasn't a fight that culminated in someone getting shot. They believe this was an execution. 
portraying not a frightened, diminutive immigrant, but quite possibly the first person in this jurisdiction to commit murder over landscaping. The neighbor assaulted me and I shot him. You shot him? Yes. Calm, collected, trying to assure the 911 operator that he is a responsible person. The defense scrambling. It sounds so stupid. We're talking about trimming trees. It's on this man's land. Defense attorney Richard Burkhan tries to assert that the Georgian Emma Gray was simply engaged in that most American of activities, protecting his homestead. Drop on your common sense. You've got a much larger person and a much smaller person that's going, don't work here anymore. And that's what Mr. Bilkin was enduring, threatening behavior. But it was his unsympathetic demeanor on the witness stand, often nonchalant, sometimes even laughing, that had more of an impact on jury foreman Brooke Haley. The fact that he was his own character witness and he didn't acquit himself well. I uh, am ashamed to uh, use this figure of speech, but he shot himself in the foot on the stand. Yeah. Finally, just last month, the verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Michael Vilkin, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. First degree murder. Those words cruelly ricocheting in Tamar Vilkin's head. When you were sitting there in court and you heard murder in the first degree, what went through your mind? I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. I still don't believe it. I'm going to appeal as much as as far as I can go. It doesn't matter whatever it takes. I am going to fight. We meet outside the courthouse and jail complex. Inside, just a few yards down these grim, color-coded halls, behind that thick glass, we meet inmate Vilkin. Mr. Vilkin, how are you? Still emitting a glow of self-righteousness. What did you think that they were going to give you? What was the verdict that you expected? The worst case, that's what Vilkin says when he bought that land, he felt like a citizen farmer, nurturing it until he was ready to build. Why was it so important to you? What were your dreams for that land? I wanted to uh, clear the land from the wood and uh, to build the house there. Those fuzzy dreams, he says, were soon uprooted by his fear. Or was it enmity for that bear of a neighbor, John Upton? Did he ever raise a hand at you? No, he did not. But I was afraid of him, really afraid, because he was roaring at me, he was yelling at me. On the stand, and in person, you don't seem like someone who is afraid. On the stand? Well, you didn't show any emotion. You never showed that you seemed afraid. I'm not a Hollywood actor. But in Vilkin's mind, he embellished the neighbor feud into a Hollywood mobster movie starring John Upton as the villain. He acted like a gangster, like a tough guy, like a mafioso. What you're saying is that John Upton deserved to die? No. I'm saying that I saw a mafioso and I was afraid of him. Mr. Vilkin, it sounds, no offense, but it sounds like you're detached from reality. This was a fight over shrubbery. This had nothing to do with mafia. No. He encroached on the road. So you expected to shoot him? I expected to act in self-defense. Regrets? Not even a few. If you spit in my face, I will not just turn around and, and leave. You don't turn the other cheek? No. No. And Upton was, figuratively speaking, was spitting in my face the whole year. But probe beneath all that bravado, and it's clear Vilkin knows he shattered the person he loves most. Do you feel badly for your wife? For Tamara? Yes. Yes, of course. Because you know that this has destroyed her. She loves you more than anything in the world. I know. Vilkin, his beard whiter now after 18 months in jail, tells me he'll appeal, saying his lawyer was incompetent. And he's got a handwritten note that he wants us to read, listing his complaints. Defense counsel did not explain to the jury the effect of provocation. I was sitting there like a hostage while my defense counsel was blowing hot air. But as we wrap the interview, this convicted killer, who at times smiled like a kindly uncle,
patiently answering all of my questions without a hint of anger or remorse leaves me with one final chilling thought. Are you hopeful? I'm always hopeful. Unless I see a pistol in your hand. Then you shoot me. Then I will shoot you in one second. Our time is over. Vilkin turns and walks to the guard station, cheerfully nodding to his jailers. Outside, his victim's daughter still struggling to come to terms with her loss. I can't believe that it really happened. I wake up and I feel like, okay, when is this movie going to end? And all for what? For nothing. That's the worst part. Today, the vacant lot at 2902 Lone Jack Road sits abandoned. In real estate terms, it's a distressed property with unstable slopes, but distressed also by the murder that happened here. And though the owner and his neighbor are long gone, those Brazilian pepper trees will soon grow back. Their strangling vines and poisonous fruit, a testament to the toxic obsession that pushed one man over the edge. So the question tonight, what do you think of that verdict, justified or not? And have you ever witnessed neighbors pushed over the edge, losing it? Let us know at hashtag ABC2020. Our cameras could be in your neighborhood next. Stay with us. Coming up, do you lose it when you have to wait in line? They did. Chaos at the Pasadena Apple Store. Or do you get crazier when someone cuts in line? No stopping! Get in line for video you won't believe next. I think we all hate people cutting in line, but this past weekend, another Bieber gate almost erupted over it at Disneyland. People overreacting and tweeting that Justin Bieber was using a wheelchair to cut in line for rides. His people say the wheelchair was legit, he had a knee injury, but we want to know, do you lose it over people cutting in line, celebrity or not? Here's Jay Shadler. Even in this age of instant gratification, click it, ship it, say it, here's some information, pay it. We still have to endure that ancient anger of waiting in lines. It's momentary, involuntary imprisonment. So when fast food is too slow, even a Happy Meal can turn nasty, which is what happened when this Toledo, Ohio woman was denied her chicken McNuggets. If you want fries with your police record, just biggie-size the madness. Yes, lying rage is real. It's even being studied at MIT, which is where we met Dr. Richard Larson, a renowned expert in the physics and psychology of lines. Right now, we're in line. Dr. Larson says people innately understand the rules of waiting in line. Had Moses added an 11th commandment, it may well have been, thou shalt not cut in line. When people cut in line like this, that person is saying, my time is much more valuable than your time. Some people who are close to the tipping point just totally lose it. Oh, yes, there's hell to pay. Arrests. That's what happens when you cut in line. Like this guy who tried to muscle his way to the front of an L.L. Bean store opening line. Or the line to the bathroom at an NFL game that, well, stalled, then brawled. There are kind of fundamental laws at work. The top one is first come, first serve. Chaos at the Pasadena Apple Store. The launching of a new Apple product has been the genesis of many a great line story. Like the one Pastor Scott Jones told us about. As I'm driving up, I'm thinking, this is going to be an experience. Jones and roughly 50 of the Apple faithful lined up at 4.30 in the morning to be among the first to get the iPad 2 at this Ardmore, Pennsylvania store only to have this Jenny come lately, three hours later, plant herself at the front of the pack. I'm not gonna have somebody yell at me. Honey, you haven't even heard yelling yet. She plopped herself right here. Stunned by this wicked interloper, Jones pulls out his trusty iPhone and begins videotaping her. I mean, she can't really think this is okay. Actually, she thinks cutting in line is fine. It's filming her that brings out her dark side. Oh, dude, get your hands off of me. Well, then get in the back of the line. Now the crowd takes another tack, shaming her. It's a justice issue, right? Yeah. The next thing was the police. And then she just sort of quickly got in her car and pulled away. It was as if society had stood the test. Oh, get out of the way. Get out of the way. 
perhaps, but never underestimate the likelihood of someone upping the ante. To vigilante justice. Lions can actually be hazardous to your health. Take Sam Rosenwinkel, for instance, whose story, which went viral on YouTube and introduced hundreds of thousands of viewers worldwide to the muffin maser, will bring tears to your eyes. It did his. You just came in. Popping into a Duluth, Minnesota gas station for cigarettes, he cuts in front of this woman, whose fuse was not just short, it was non-existent. No, actually, I was here first. You wait. She's just getting started, grabbing muffins slowly. I started commenting on how many muffins are left. Why that's 70 muffins? I want my I still back there. Why more muffins? That's still back there. Suddenly, the muffin lady stops buying and starts spraying. Mace. Told you, stupid Now, I did get enough muffins. You'd been maced. Yeah, kind of blew my mind. I didn't think that she was going to do that. Even though that she stepped way further out of line than I did, in my opinion. I don't think it's nice to cut in line. I should have asked her. Not surprisingly, somewhere between the danger and drudgery of line waiting, a niche business has been born. Robert Samuel is one of its pioneers. Hey, what's yeah. the name of your company? It's Sold Inc. Same old line dudes. <laughs> for a price, Robert will wait in line for you. I need to know where you are. In this case, the daily crush for the New York foodie craze called Cronuts, a scrumptious cross between a croissant and a donut. What's your hourly rate here on the Cronut line? It's $60. To stand in line today? Yes. To who? To somebody who doesn't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. Who might that be? A sultan, a hedge fund titan? No, just a sweet lady with a sweet tooth. Here you go. I don't have to get up super early. I don't have to wait in the cold. Ironically, a week after we met Robert, we found the best way to make a line disappear when the city health department found mouse droppings at the bakery. Well, it's something of a crisis. Got Corona? Yep. Since then, it's all been cleared up, and the crowds are back. Can I help you today? But it made us think of the greatest mouse and line story of them all. How good are they? Disney is superb. <laughs> Professor Larson said to learn the secrets of stopping line rage, book yourself a ticket to Disney World. So we did. And we rendezvoused with Kathy Mangum, creative executive of Walt Disney Imagineering. <laughs> At where else? The Dumbo Ride. We want you to have so much to look at or do or entertain your kids, because kids aren't the best line waiters, right? They're a little impatient. Walt Disney, our parent company, has reimagined what it means to wait in line. How many total? This isn't the Dumbo ride, this is the line to the ride, where kids play until a buzzer goes off. But of course, by then, the kids are buzzing, and getting them back in line will require its own magic trick. Now wait, you're, I see your thing has gone off. Yeah, and I can't get them out. In the end, perhaps the lesson to all these line stories is to take a deep breath, relax, and enjoy the ride. It might just be worth the wait. Coming up, rocking the vote or just your eardrums? You should be ashamed of yourself! Politicians, their meltdown moments. Knockouts, grabbing reporters, sir, sir. but bawling like a baby? <laughs> Next. Well, tonight you don't need us to tell you much of America is fed up with Washington. So many of you wondering why so little gets done. But before you lose your temper over it, wait until you see the politicians feeling the heat. Here's Nick Watt tonight with the lawmakers losing it. Here's the thing about buttoned up politicians. They expend so much effort trying not to lose it. Every utterance, focus grouped, every hair ruthlessly moosed, which makes it even more shocking when they explode. Despicable! I will not yield to the gentleman! Meet Mike Bost, a mild-mannered representative in the great state of Illinois. You seem a fairly placid, calm individual. Mm -hmm. Most times. I work great with people. Now meet his alter ego, Meltdown Mike. These damn bills are coming out of here all the damn time! Come out here in the last fucking... 
Apparently, members were asked to vote on an amended bill with no time to read it. Bost just lost it. I'm sick of it! Every year! I wasn't violent towards anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I was violent towards the papers. Oh, damn! You should be ashamed of yourselves! Enthusiastic or extreme? Either way, Bost is one of those rare and delicious examples of disorder in the house. When a mother's honor was questioned, Charles Bishop went all Mike Tyson on the Alabama Senate floor, clocking Senator Lowell Barron upside the head. Politicians are supposed to make laws, but Bishop kind of laid down the law with his fist, and that law was more or less, no one talks about my mama. And there are other members of this illustrious club, like US Congressman Jared Polis, who just like a good shout. They are here because our government is tearing apart their families, Madam Speaker. But you know, far more damaging for the not so level headed lawmaker is the media meltdown. Earlier this year, New York Representative Michael Grimm was being interviewed on New York One. What about Michael Grimm does not want to talk about. But Grimm was peeved at the reporters questioning about campaign finance, and when he thought the camera was off, he was back. Why? I'm going to be clear to you. You have to do that to me again. I'll tell you what. Grimm apologized for the outburst. The bottom line is sometimes I wear my emotions on my sleeve. He was later indicted on 20 counts of fraud, perjury, and obstruction in relation with his business affairs. He claims he's not guilty. We're going to fight tooth and nail until I am fully exonerated. And everyone else was left wondering, how exactly do you break a boy? Another media meltdown apology was offered by Democratic Congressman Bob Etheridge after this. Whoa, who are you? Etheridge said he was just having a bad day when he kicked off an college kid who was only trying to interview him. Sir, 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 please. Now, Republican strategists later told the New York Times this wasn't an innocent college project. They were baiting Etheridge, and he bit. You know who judges me? I'm telling you. You know who judges me? Go visit with your rabbi. Kicking it up a level are the politicians who turn on their own constituents. You know, those pesky people who actually elect them. Take Anthony Weiner. No sooner had he weathered the whole Johnson on the internet saga when a guy in the New York bakery insulted his wife and called him a scumbag. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, you're disgusting. Go on, Yeah, it takes one to know one, jackass. I think in the grand scheme, seeing his penis was worse. Another fatal flaw can be overexcitement. There are some crazy campaigners out there. Remember that scream a decade ago? <laughs> some say derailed Howard Dean's election chances. When Howard Dean gave that speech at the time, I was like, hey, amen, Howard Dean. Because you know what he was? He was authentic. Howard Dean's dream was the White House. Phil Davison's dream was this. I am seeking our party's nomination for the position of Stark County Treasurer. We're talking Stark County, Ohio. I have been a Republican in times good, and I have been a Republican in times bad. The Stark County Treasurer's office is a mess. It's obvious he's just dialed up the passion too high. Even Davison gradually figured that out in mid-flow. There was a little backing away in the room. There was a couple people, the majority of people put their head down, but I can kind of sense that you know, something's wrong here. And listen, he'd been warned. When I was practicing the speech, the dog would start to run away from me. I should have known at that point something might go drastically wrong. He forgot the most important rule of public speaking. Try 